Okay, welcome to part two of diarrheal diseases. We had just finished talking about why antibiotic therapy needs to be very carefully undertaken or not undertaken at all if um, there is something like an E. coli infection in the blood because it can actually just release more endotoxin which could exacerbate the situation leading to septic shock. I wanted to mention here that the whole reason that Shigella and this kind of E. coli, E0157, is able to make us sick is because we have receptors that its toxin can bind to. But there are some animals that lack that receptor, so although they can be carriers, they don't actually get symptoms. And the good example I'll use here are things like cattle, pigs, and deer. And of course, I've drawn a little piggy for you here. So these organisms are, um, they lack receptors on their intestinal cells that are able to bind to shigatoxin. So lucky for them, they aren't going to get sick. So these animals can be carriers though which means that they um, could have the organism living inside of them, but not suffer any symptoms, and then they could pass it to humans if, the, if, if something from their feces gets onto like our lettuce, for example. So animals can be carriers for microbes such as E. coli 0157, oops, H7, and this goes back a ways in the class, but this O stand is part of the O polysaccharide on the lipopolysaccharide, and the H stands for um, the type of filament in uh, E. coli flagella. So this is how we're able to identify a particular type of E. coli that's more likely to make people get sick than other kinds. So they can be carriers and pass it to humans. And to recap then, the reason that they don't get sick is because their intestinal cells don't have receptors that can bind to the Shiga toxin. So the Shiga toxin just stays harmlessly inside the lumen and isn't able to get into the blood. So um, but right before my phone ran out of memory, uh, I had been talking about the toxins that if they get into the bloodstream, they could also be sensed by white blood cells. And if they're sensed by white blood cells, that's going to cause inflammation. But the white blood cell could also sense the entry of the bacterial cells themselves. So Shigella and um, enterohemorrhagic uh, E. coli are able to get inside of our intestinal cells if they are uh, trigger endocytosis, if they can bind to a receptor and get in there. And then something they do that is pretty dang amazing is they can attach to our actin, which is a cytoskeletal element in our cell, and they can use that to so see how now they're going to be like, and they're going to move. I'll use black pen though. They're going to move into the next intestinal cell. They'll start multiplying, and then they'll harness our actin in that cell too. And they're grabbing our actin. They're polymerizing our actin, making a chain out of it, making like a little uh, rotor on the end of their body, and then vroom. They're able to then pop into the next cell too. And you can see that this is going to allow them to very quickly spread and damage lots of intestinal cells and can really wreak havoc. And then let me remind you that if the toxin has already been doing a little bit of damage as well, now these red blood cells are just going to continue hemorrhaging out into the gut. I also want to point out Imagine the recovery time from something like this, because if a bunch of these cells are all destroyed by this quickly traveling bacteria, not only does the patient suffer from bloody diarrhea and could die from the disease, but when they get better, they have to reheal and reform this lining. They have to reestablish healthy flora here, and that can take years for some people. And if it's an elderly person, they might never have the same digestive situation again. Sometimes after a bad diarrheal disease, someone might find out, oh, I'm lactose intolerant now. And that 
Oh, I've got a cat out there. Uh, and that could be because we have these brush border enzymes that are on our intestinal cells and they hold the enzyme lactase. But if all these cells get destroyed, now you don't have that lactase enzyme. Hang on one second, I'm gonna let uh, Frodo in. They get by all my lights. Okay. Come on, Frodo. This is the cat I like the most, it's Frodo, but he was scratching on my screen to get in. This is what happens, I guess, by making videos at home. But if I try to make them in my office, I get even less accomplished than I do at home. Okay, we're back, back to work. So this um, bacteria is flying along, it's polymerizing our actin. Let's put this in purple. So um, Shigella and Listeria, uh, which I haven't mentioned yet, but Listeriosis is another bacteria. And that one is a purple, um, or sorry, gram positive rod, and it and it also um, can get inside and then move from cell to cell. They are famous. So here I could do it like this too. They're gram positive. Shigella is gram negative. Gram negative rod. So Shigella and Listeria are both famous for harnessing our actin. to move from cell to cell. Let's go ahead and block that in. Okay. So we've talked about Shigella, Listeria, and then certain strains of E. coli so far. Uh, now, um, imagine if the bacteria is actually able to get inside of, uh, if it's taken up by a macrophage, so we can say, and whether or not this macrophage is able to destroy the bacteria or not, we're going to have inflammation. So I think I wrote this, um, and when you weren't paying, when the video had stopped, sorry, because I ran out of memory. So the white blood cell is stimulated to cause inflammation. And when that happens, adaptive immunity gets to work. So let's put that next. Because we know that adaptive immunity requires some sort of an alert in order to get helper T cells working. So this is what we've drawn here. We're gonna have a helper T cell, and if this gets activated and stimulated, then that means that we're gonna have adaptive immunity um, occurring. And let's put um, a receptor on the helper T cell and a matching receptor on the antigen presenting cell. So it may be a, another cell that has encountered the bacteria. Remember, those can be macrophages or dendritic cells. So the antigen-presenting cell presents an antigen from the bacteria to a helper T cell, and then the helper T cell stimulates um, the cytotoxic T cells, which are able to directly destroy the pathogens, either with chemicals or by attracting macrophages. And then that, and so that's the cell mediated side of adaptive immunity. Then the humoral mediated side is uh, uh, the B cells that get all big when they're activated to form plasma cells and then they make antibodies. So when the B cells are activated, then they form antibodies. We'll put those in blue, lots of antibodies. But this doesn't come without its risks. We know that antibodies are great when they bind to pathogens because when they bind to the pathogen, then the pathogen, um, 
first of all, is more likely to be noticed and eaten by a macrophage, and also it's less likely to be able to go about doing its dangerous activities. But unfortunately, sometimes we can have a cross-reactivity where the antibodies also bind to some part of the person's bodies, body. And if that happens, then we can have um, a, a, what's called reactive arthritis or some other kind of um, cross-reactivity. So um, let's put that in orange, and we're going to have to write this kind of small. So this is our uh, one warning over here about antibiotics, and then here will be another warning. Immunity may come at a cost. If the antibodies bind to our joints or other organs, bind to our own organs. And this is so well established. It's a common problem about two to three weeks after a diarrheal disease. Um, if this happens, someone gets really sore joints, they are probably experiencing what's called reactive arthritis when the antibodies are affecting their own body. And it seems to be common that it affects the joints, but it really makes you wonder what other kind of symptoms that people often have after a bad infection that could be related. This one's pretty well established is joint pain. So even successful attacks on the pathogen can come with unwanted side effects. Okay, so now I want to, the last part of this video, uh, show you how watery diarrhea is different than bloody diarrhea. It really comes down to that the toxin is um, a, uh, is is going to cause a different effect on the intestinal cells. I should have drawn these as little curves because Vibrio cholera is the classic one. So I'm going to change the shape. Vibrio means like a curved shape. So these bacteria are kind of curved like that. And we'll use green though for toxin. So they're going to be making a toxin. And this Vibrio toxin causes uh, chloride channels, or sorry, potassium channels to be inserted into the cell membrane. So uh, Vibrio, oh, I don't want to use green for that. Sorry, uh, purple. Let's use purple. Vibrio cholera. Toxin. Usually it's just called cholera toxin. So cholera toxin causes potassium channels to be inserted in the cell membrane. So these channels are stored for when they're needed inside of the cell, and sometimes they're making extras of them or not. But in this situation, what happens is you get this insertion of the potassium channels into the membrane. So this is a potassium channel. This is what the toxin causes to happen. Oh, sorry, I should put, so when this, it binds to a different receptor, and when it binds to that receptor, the result is you get this insertion of the potassium channels. Now, if you'll remember, in your cells, you have a high concentration of potassium inside your cells and low outside, like in the blood and stuff. So potassium will always go out of a cell if a channel is inserted and it's basically, if a door is opened, potassium leaves a cell. We talk about this when we talk about action potentials, we talk about it when we talk about uh, like water uh, acid-base balance, but the, the gist of it is, is that when you insert a potassium channel, you are going to get this massive efflux. So that means a leaving of potassium. And when all, all that potassium leaves, it's a solute. And so then, I mean, it is an ion, but then what happens is water will follow to try and dilute that. And so water will follow the potassium and then you get all this watery diarrhea. So um, potassium will leave the cell and that's because it's going down its concentration gradient. So this is a passive diffusion. And then water will follow. 
And you can end up with a really scary situation where not only is the person losing massive amounts of water, but they're also losing a bunch of potassium, and that will give them electrolyte imbalances, which can lead to a heart failure. So we'll box this in here. So we get extreme dehydration. I'm going to use purple again. Extreme dehydration. And because of the potassium leaving, we also have electrolyte imbalance, and that can lead to um, muscle contraction problems, and most importantly with that, heart function problems. So electrolyte imbalances will occur too. So cholera is the most important and famous one of these. And um, in fact, it's typically, well, I'll use, um, uh, what color do I want to use? Maybe just black. So rice water. rice water diarrhea 